Um, there it is. Hello, Mimi. National Trust, Mimi. Hello, nice to see you. Hi. Technology's letting me down again. No. <laughs> We're, we're, we're fine. We're totally cool with all the technology, aren't we, guys? No, I don't have technical issues at all. Never do. <laughs> hey, Charlie, how you doing? What's up, Reg? Good, thank you. Hopefully this is uh, not going to crash. <laughs> things 30 people that's what 45 percent on our on our 70 percent of right i'm getting there <laughs> never sure about like facebook or eventbrite attendee numbers because it's very easy to click i'm going and then maybe harder to actually join at 7 p.m. So thank you for everybody that is here. We'll give it a few more minutes. Um, just trying to fill the fill the air time. Not, not got a voice for radio. Although I used to do radio uh, at uh, music festivals. And it was hilarious. But I had, I had several other people around me. It wasn't just myself. So <laughs> I can monologue. I can do that. What are festivals, Rich? Boardmasters. I think we may well have came across Dom. Dom Ferris came to our, uh, our thing to talk about what he used to do. Um, yeah. We may have crossed paths. Uh, we did Boardmasters two years on the trot with Secret Garden Party, five years on the trot, and then a couple of smaller ones around here. Um, the people who we did the radio with at Secret Garden Party had been doing it for a very long time. They're called uh, Meat Transmission. And I think that they, they now have, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a London thing. They have a big, um, they're all on Just Eat and stuff now. Yes. I had that. Try incognito mode on the browser. Thank you. Thank you for that. Is that Ellie? I can see. Okay, cool. Um, we're three minutes over. We've got 40 people in. Um, I think that's pretty cool to start. Would you agree? Technical support? Are you cool to, okay to let other people in as they come? All right, cool. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It's so cool to see uh, so many of you here uh, at dinner time. Um, on a Wednesday night. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's, it's great to see so many people, not just people we know, people I've been saying hello to, but also people who, who we don't know, who have no idea who you are. So it's great to great to see that our message and, and, and you guys are interested in what we do. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, because of that, I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna assume that you know about Trash Free Trails, that you know who we are. But like I say, if you have any questions before, during or after, fire them over um, to Rachel in, in the chat and she'll figure it out for sure. Um, so we were hunting for a title for this for, for quite a long time. And honestly, because Rachel likes onions, she has her own theater company called The Wild, uh, the show's called The Wild Onion, right? And, you know, it, seriously, I've seen it happen. They, they rub them in their eyes and smash them on the floor and stuff. It's crazy, absolute theatrical experience beyond anything else I've ever experienced before, if I'm to totally honest with you. Um, but for the purpose of this panel, and the fact, like I say, that you kind of know what we do. And I don't think we should, we're going to be explaining to people why you shouldn't litter. Uh, so you might guess that that's not, not what the talk's about. We're going to focus on the language and the terminology. So what we say and how, and how we say it is influenced by our own set of experiences. At the same time, the way people interpret what we say is influenced by their own set of experiences. Those, that interpretation, those thoughts, can often translate into behavior or behaviors. So whilst exploring why we have chosen and you have chosen as the trash mob to not use a certain word, a certain way of speaking, a certain way of understanding, we might also be looking at something a little bit more than just that word. So the history of that choice of word, the history of that choice of language, where that came from, um, and perhaps therefore in doing so, we'll be looking at the history of the behavior that we're trying to change. So our three programs of work, Clean Trails, Purpose of Adventures, and Education Understanding, Education and Understanding, 
if if we don't understand what we're going to do what like the problem if we don't understand why we're doing it then we, we're not going to do very well to to solve that problem so uh before i go any further i'll just let the uh the panelists introduce themselves um i'll just do the names quickly we've got dom who's the managing director and founder of trust Free trails um yeah sorry i'll let you know sorry you can do it yourself <laughs> i was just going to go into full flow there <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, you've done it, Rich. And thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, it's amazing to have you here. And, and thanks to Rich and Rach to, to organising it so well. Um, yeah, uh, I am. My title is what Rich said it was. Uh, <laughs> and and little tiny bit of background that I'll go into a bit more is that I, prior to founding Trash Trolls, I worked for Surfers Against Sewage um, as the head of community engagement for almost 10 years from 2010. Thank you, John. Uh, Lauren? Hi, I'm Lauren, and I am a Trash Free Trails A-teamer. Um, I also work for a charity called Morecambe Bay Partnership, and we've done some cool collaboration work for Trash Free Trails with that. And um, I do my own open water swim coaching stuff and triathlon coaching stuff, so I use the outdoors a lot within other work. And then I think we've got Chloe. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Chloe. I'm also a team for Trashy Trails. Um, up in the Lake District as well, same as Lauren. Um, I actually work in software development, but um, I've been actively involved in Trashy Trails since doing my degree in outdoor adventure environment or science. You're a little bit glitchy. Uh, I think everybody got that. Uh, so yeah, welcome to the panelists. We are going to be joined by, uh, I think it, it is Dr. Nathan uh, Abrams from Bangor University. Uh, we'll see about introducing him. He, he needs no introduction as, as you'll probably see, but he'll, he'll slip in and contribute around the sort of second question. So how this is going to go, we're going to ask, uh, Dom's going to give us a little, little introduction and then we're going to go through three questions followed by a Q and A. So I will ask that if anything does pop up during the course of it, uh, just throw it in the chat to to Rachel and we'll we'll log it for for afterwards. We're just going to try and keep the conversation with the panelists during the questions. And then if you've got anything, like I say, if you've got anything that pops up, there'll be some time for that um, just afterwards. So, yeah, let's get cracking. So, Dom, could you give us a short introduction to your initial ideas around the terminology of litter and how that's informed both your master's research? So for the benefit of people that don't know what that is, that's the state of our trails. Uh, report that is in collaboration with Bangor University, as well as the foundation of uh, of Trash Free Trails. Short, you say, yeah? <laughs> You've muted yourself. Um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so, made the mistake of trying to revise a little bit for this before I started and realized how many different angles my thoughts go on this. So I'm gonna try and like find some origin stories for it. So. I think um, one of the origin moments for this thought process that led us led me or uh, me to this conversation was, um, you know, on those beach cleans at Surfers Against Sewage for those ten years, the hearing some kind of common questions from people that were often spoken to me in outrage. So really, I suppose they could be uh, uh, all all classified as outraged questions. And generally, there was one word that kept popping up. Why do people do it? Why? Why do they think it's OK? Why, you know, why do these people do this? And 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 one thing, the early door for me was was that question is like, do you know what? I don't really know why. Like, I don't I don't know why. And we definitely scientifically don't really know why. Um, and I'm kind of getting bored of not knowing why. I'm definitely getting a bit bored of the why, especially when it's followed by people, but you know, why the, outr the outrage is often backed up with people blaming and shaming others, um, judging people, calling people scumbags. And I, I had a strong aversion to that for many reasons, um, and as did Surfs Against Sewage. So the, those, those things started to tie together quite early as I would like to know why, I don't know why, and it's, it's been many years now of, of thinking about that. So I, I was thinking I'd like, to, I'd like to progress my understanding of this issue. Um, again, also speaking to the outrage is that I uh, instinctively kind of was, was repulsed, had an aversion to outrage or blame or shame or guilt, um, you know, I had, for people telling me what they were against, what they hated, what was bad about it. 
um, and I had a, I, had, I was drawn to, I was, you know, I was drawn to people who spoke what, about what they were for. So what they wanted to achieve, the positive things they'd like to see. What, and, and then again, another angle was why I was compelled to take these actions and why others were compelled to come down and donate their time to clean their beaches, rivers, trails. Um, and, and for me, the why is because I love those places. Uh, you know, and, and so again, love is a far more, for me, a far more powerful and positive and sustainable emotion um, than is hate. Uh, is blame, is shame, is guilt. So these things started to form slowly but surely. And um, I often find that these judgmental, hate, hate-filled hate comments, you know, litter was a word that was used, was was almost like a kind of um, a, a rallying point, a scratching post for these emotions for people. So again, I started to think about that term um, and, and think about uh, what it meant in relation to the why. So um, that was some early stuff. And I, what I thought was obviously, well, okay, if I want to understand a bit more about why um, um, people litter, I need to educate myself more. So I started at the same time as around founding Trash Free Trails in my mind in 2016, I started looking into the science behind it, especially on recreational trails. And what I found at the same time as this is I found there was no science whatsoever on the causes, prevalence and impacts of what we what was then calling litter on recreational trails so on on our trails and wild places um and again immediately i was struck by the massive juxtaposition to the huge amount of science and action and awareness on marine plastic pollution something i can talk about a bit more so again i was like oh god okay well uh, one thing i want trash free trails to do is to contribute to increasing our understanding but actually perhaps maybe i Maybe I could be, maybe I could try to do that myself. And very early on in Trash Free Trails' history, um, the state of our trails report was born. So the idea that we would um, we would encourage people to not only take the simple yet positive act of removing plastic pollution, but to try to squeeze as much benefit out of that activity as we could um, by trying to make sure it contributes to furthering our scientific understanding. So it, it bubbled along. Um, at the same time of this, uh, I started to think about the language of litter and, and, and what that would do for motivation. So um, our core value at Trash Free Trails, or one of our core values, is that we will, we will always be positive and solution focused, and we will never use blame, shame, guilt, or aggression as a tactic. And we found that using the word litter often makes that very difficult to stick to that value because people have um, have preconceived um, thoughts about it. So I will pause a second just for a second and say and ask you a question to maybe come back to later on in the in the talk is how does the word litter make you feel? Um, both the you know both as a noun and a verb I suppose um, and what uh, and what comparable feeling can you find to that or what can you compare that to and i'll, I'll come back to that later on about um um, um to, to see what you what you think i'd love to hear it maybe you can even put it in the chat as we go it might be interesting um so um we came to that i came to this question so then then i started doing my research and i found uh a article online that is yeah i mean it sounds odd but it's changed my life because it it cemented my desire to research the issue and it changed completely some completely um it put words to the feelings i've been having about the terminology the language we were using around litter uh and it it it, it uh, helped me with that slight little tink little little kind of scratchy inkling inside that there was something else going on there was there was something in the in the shadows and that article was from mother jones and it was called the origins of anti-litter campaigns um and and this is a story I'll tell you, really. And it's a bit, it's a bit about, you know, when I heard this story, it kind of changed everything and, and made me even more averse to the word litter. Um, so in uh, 1953, um, uh, a law was passed uh, in Vermont um, banning the use of single-use drinks containers. At that stage, it was cans and glass. Um, now, the single-use products had exponentially grown after World War II. 
Um, there's a big story behind that. If you read the article, you'll you'll see that it's a, how can we keep producing and profit making at the same rate as World War II? Um, now there's no war. And they identified convenience, disposability as the way to do that. By 1953, some of the downsides of that were starting to show their head, and that being single-use container litter. Now, in, in Vermont in 1953, um, a landowner who was in the Vermont um, um, Congress, um, he was a, was a farmer, and his one of his cows died eating broken glass. And this was the kind of last straw for him and his um, fellow farmers, and they had huge influence, and they, Vermont passed this law. Now, at this moment, an alliance of big business, American can company, Coca-Cola, Dixie Cups, realized what a massive threat this was to their profits. And they immediately went on the attack and they formed what we what what is now known as or they formed Keep America Beautiful. Keep America Beautiful was formed by drinks container companies, big business, um, and they workshopped an idea that would help them deflect attention. Very deliberate, very strategic. They came up with, they, they used an ad a PR company um, who were responsible for some other amazing things like defending DuPont um, uh, during the Teflon controversy. Um, and they workshopped and came up with both the term, well, they recoined the term, and the um, icon, which again, maybe someone could chuck in a, a link in the chat. You can see the actual litter bug. They designed that with the deliberate intention of deflecting attention away from them onto the individual consumer. And at that same moment, they formed Keep America Beautiful, 1954, and they began their first anti-litter campaigns. So for me, the following year as well, the following year, Keep Britain Tidy was formed on a very similar basis. So for me personally, um, using Keep Britain Tidy, they began 69 years ago. I think maybe I've got my maths right there. And... Um, they there's two terms being used there there is anti what so in other words what we are against what we hate and there is litter with all of its connotations which is fraudulently created by big business to deflect away from their needs to create consumption there's so many more things i can come up with and i've made this huge list and i'm going over my time a little bit so i'm uh, going to wrap it up a little bit and come come to it so for me i'm not and then the other thing to say just to finish this a little bit is is now I've I've said about our commitment to never using you know being positive and not using blame shame guilt or aggression as a tactic. So I'm concerned about how this will come across. It will come across as criticism, but I just want to say state some facts. Is that and just think about the terminology, what they're called. Keep Britain tidy was formed in 1954. It was formed to keep Britain tidy. In their in in their 2009. Um, in their 2009, their own 2009 report, they reported a 500% increase in litter on the UK streets. Has that campaign worked? Have they kept Britain tidy? If we're to, if we're not to say that it's entirely their fault, they haven't. There must be something else going on. There is missing data there. It's like dark matter. There's something else going on. Which for us, for me again, is that basing our actions and our activities on fraudulent or a lack of data. Um, so not only are we basing it on negativity and hate rather than love and positivity, we're basing it on either lack of data, lack of information, lack of critical consumption of that information, or just a complete denial of it in, in the first place. So all of that brings us right up to, all right, well, okay, if it isn't litter, what is it? Um, and um, so there's a few things, is that the majority of what we find the, the of what we find discarded in environments be that trails rivers estuaries streets parks beaches is plastic and uh, the rest of its cans um and uh, you know comes very close aluminium afterwards um and uh the uh, vast majority of that is single use products produced deliberately for to be used once and discarded off discarded um, when it escapes into the environment, what does it do? It has been proven across all ecosystems to cause harm, to be deleterious to those ecosystems. So what therefore is it, can it be classified as? You know, 
Is it litter? Where if you go to leaf litter, that's actually biologically good. That is doing good or being used by life for life. So what's a better term for it? Or what is the term for it? The term is pollution. It's an exact definition. It is discarded. It is not natural. It is man-made in that environment and it is causing harm. So that brings us all the way up to why we've chosen to call it single use pollution. It's very difficult, so difficult. I'll say the word litter throughout this thing. Uh, Rich will say it, we'll all say it. Um, but I believe that anti-litter campaigns have not, are not working, and may even be becoming part of the establishment. Um, if you trace their funding, you can do that too. Um, and um, the word itself is not appropriate for the, the, the issue, the tackle, the issue that we're trying to tackle. So there's a million other thought lines I have around that, and I probably babbled too much, but that's where we got to. One, one minute over. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Round of applause for Tom. Uh, or not. Uh, uh, yeah, so thanks, man. Um, it, yeah, so much going on there. So all the kind of stuff that I said at the beginning around, I mean, only in a paragraph, but the, the, the link that the word litters had to emotions, the link that those emotions might have to feelings and the link that Dom made to that why are really interesting and, and kind of what we're looking to explore today. How that word might influence motivation and how it links to your, like how language links to your values and how language links to how you conduct yourself as a person. And moving on from that and the reason we exist and the, the reason we're having this conversation right now is because those campaigns don't work. Anti-litter campaigns don't work. The word litter doesn't work. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll head into the questions now. Um, I believe we yeah we are joined now by our our other speaker, which is uh, Nathan. So I'll let you introduce yourself, Nathan. If that's all right. Uh, yeah, not having a clue what anyone else said. Apologies for being late, but I um I, I come from football training, um, which Don described as a proper excuse. Um, uh, yeah, um, I teach film studies at the university, uh, Bangor University, and um. I've just, um, well, we've been working with Trash Free Trails be almost a year now um, on, on a university funded project uh, around this issue. Um, so I'm kind of new to this game, but um, from the conversations I've had with Dom um, in particular over the past year, I believe I have something new to offer. Um, we'll find out. Uh, is, is that the kind of introduction you're looking for? <laughs> That, that, well, I don't know. Ask everybody else. <laughs> um, no, that's uh, that's great, Nathan. Thank you very much. Hey, Rich, can I can I reiterate? Because I think that I think that's the key. That is that is then not it not necessarily wanting to criticise what's go, gone on or is going on before, but having a strong feeling that it's worth trying something new. Which is exactly why pe speaking to people like Nathan, not just going to speak to someone who's been working on litter for seventy years. You know. Um, speaking to new people, thinking about new things, trying new things, being positive. Yeah, cool. Uh, thanks, man. Um, so, yeah, Nathan, sorry, just, just for Nathan's benefit, we've not, we've not done anything beyond introductions and then Dom's little introduction just to, around the topic, which I'm sure you've heard uh, more, than, more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to have three questions and then we're going to do Q&A a little bit at the end. So we'll go for the first question. So it's quite a simple, it's quite a, quite a short one, but does litter, does calling it litter actually contribute to the problem? Um, I'll go for, I'll go for Lauren first. Oh God, I've put on the spot. Um, does calling it litter add to the problem? I feel like that was really interesting, Don, what you've just said in the history of anti-litter campaigns. I didn't actually know um, much of that. And I think I've been thinking about the word litter from a psychology perspective, I think. And like a lot of people have said as well, that it does bring up lots of negative emotions um, and we associate the negative behavior with litter. So I would, yeah, in a short answer, I would say, yes, I think it probably does. And I think like Dom's explaining, we probably need to rephrase and reframe things and um, come up with, with different terms, so yeah. What does um, Nathan think or Chloe? <laughs> I was going to say Nathan. I just said Nathan on mute. But if Chloe's talking, sorry. 
Can I just, sorry, I had a bit of a technical um, issue earlier. So can everyone hear me okay before I continue? Yeah, it's great, yeah. Oh, okay, super. So I guess one of the things about the semantics of calling it, it litter, I think obviously we know that it's been a term, as Dom has um, very rightfully said there, that's been used quite frequently within the last 70 odd years. And I think it's one of these things that a lot of people have begun to disassociate the word litter from the actual problem itself. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know uh, where everyone is based, but if you go into a lot of cities, for example, you look at a bin and it literally says on the side of it, it's a, it's a litter bin. Now, to me, litter is something that should maybe belong in the bin. It's that bit of pollution that is meant to go somewhere else, but it's ended up on the floor in nature where it shouldn't be. But it's a term that I think gets thrown around a lot and it maybe doesn't quite actually address the, the problem. If that, I don't know if that's going on a little bit off tangent, but for me, I think a lot of people think of the term litter and they don't necessarily address what it actually, it means to, for something, not only to be litter, but the effects that it has. So it's not so much actually that it contributes to the problem, it's almost separate from it actually the fact that i mean that's that's certainly how i think of it sometimes but like you say when i i had I actually called the dom about this not so long ago i was like just seen lit the word litter on a bin and it doesn't make any sense does it and he was like ah see it's taken two and a half years but now it's gonna now you're gonna see it everywhere um so yeah like that 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 point of view is really interesting that it, it, <clears throat> the word like means more than just one thing it's not it's not just the one thing that you, you might think it is like is it litter that's in the bin or is it not so uh yeah, what do you what do you think, Nathan? Yeah, um, it's sorry, I, mean, I didn't hear all of uh, Dom's introduction. I haven't heard the same speech <laughs> that many times. Is yeah, so for me, it's it automatically got negative connotations. Other than it's just not the sound. What you do with your head, see then? There you go. <laughs> I've been heckled. Um, I think first Zoom heckle. Um, so I don't think it's bad. I, I take the point that the, 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 the campaigns haven't been working. Um, so that might be not around the words they're using, but the campaign they're using. Because for me, other than a litter of animals or a litter which you use to carry people, which I suppose is negative, then then um, it's good that the word has negative connotations. I mean, it's very interesting to think that do people have positive connotations of the word litter? Because if they do, then that's a problem. So that it continues to remain negative is a good thing, right? Because we, we want it to, make, to be a bad thing. Um, whether the word itself is the issue, I, I'd be more personally, I'd contextualize it and think, um, well, how's it been deployed? If it's been ineffective, then what's the wider campaign has been ineffective as opposed to, because that's not, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, whatever the nice way of saying that is these days. Um, because the word itself might be effective, it's just marketed wrongly. That's what I'm kind of really interested in is, is the marketing side of this. Um, you know, if if the marketing's done well, you could almost use anything, right? As long as the term itself doesn't carry connotations that we don't want, if that makes sense. So that would be my intervention there um, about the wider marketing campaign. That's where I'm really interested. Um, that's, that's such a good point. The the the, yeah, the kind of cut your nose off to spite your face thing. That's why I've been thinking about quite a lot. It's like it's such a it, it's such a oh god, use a use a annoying. Uh, but Boris Johnson's oven ready thing for any organization who who's good at communicating you pick litter up and you can run with it quite quickly um but so, and so that that's something we've been wrestling with quite a lot um I think I think it's the I think don't think it's maybe necessarily exactly just the pure negative connotations of the word itself I think it's the way it's been used and then the way that the way that we've been trained again that's why I asked that question at the start like what 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 feeling you know what power of feeling does it evoke and i often think it's if you think about how angry you get about litter or just thinking about litter it's kind of incomparable to something similarly bad or good you know like so again what's happened there you know and and I'm, some of the stuff i've been reading today you know we oh i i got i've got a quote i'll pick it up in a second but it's literally deliberately training you know people you know and and, and uh yeah so it's it's a uh, I, I agree, but also then if you attach anti anti to it, you know you're kind of doubling down on that. Um, 
and uh, yeah but let's not let's not completely if it's still a word that could be powerful for us um then yes definitely not discount it well we'll we'll come on to whether we've made a right decision uh gentlemen so thank you for that <laughs> um but yeah like for, for me it's a, a kind of going back to i think it was e either lauren or chloe or maybe a combination of what you both said that actually <clears throat> it's not so much the word but like nathan said it's how how that word is understood and how it's interpreted and what happens as a result of those interpretations and as a result the word um litter is both uh, i mean sorry if i'm stealing this right from your notes but it's a, it's a verb and a noun so it is it's a, it's a thing and it's also a thing that you do uh, so uh it, dom's been dom's been talking about nudge theory a lot recently so it's the idea that quiet I, I think i'm understanding this correctly it's the idea that um you can be like subconsciously provoked into doing a thing through the things that you kind of see a bit like subliminal messaging maybe something like that so i guess the idea and to, to oversimplify something is if you keep seeing the word litter and around it maybe doesn't make it such a bad thing to drop it um so yeah that kind of misunderstanding where you have a verb and a noun might play into play into part of the problem um so yeah we can we can move on unless it, any any of the, any of the other panelists have uh, anything to add do you guys have anything to add or are we, are we good don't okay. get me don't get me started on nudge theory it's a, yeah it's a, a, a slight of one of the ones yes but again yeah um would you send us a list of future questions? Because I don't want to shoot. It. <laughs> you know, we could say something here. It's like, no, you're going to ask us that in five minutes' time. Uh, okay, uh, Rach, can technical support might be able to help you with that, Nathan, if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, I think while, while that's happening too, so that's before we go to the next one. Again, I think it's also, I, 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 I don't use positive. You know, we don't talk about positive um, and and not negative, just be, just because it's nice and in you know and nice and airy fairy. It's proven to be a far more effective way of doing it that's the other thing too it's just strategic decisions we're making we're not you know so n again nudge theory is a great example of that you know um telling putting a sign up saying thousands of people have left litter here please don't litter mm -hmm. actually actually causes more litter yeah. because it's social it's called social proof people go oh thousands of other people have done it brilliant social proof so that that does not work whereas saying um, 948,000 people summited Snowden in 2021, I think, uh, maybe somewhere out there, dates or numbers. Um, but saying, for, and you know, I we only found we, we only counted 700, we only counted 748 pieces of litter last time we did a count there. So I don't know, just really, really kind of back of the fag packet maths here. Science is not stats, I know, but for example, we could say uh, 947,000 people left left this left this beautiful mountain clear than they found it last year well done you're all amazing mountaineers there's so many bits of positive social proof there and again that's been shown to reduce um negative behavior or increase the behavior you want to happen so yeah this is not we're not just like i say it's, it's not just because it's all nicey nicey cool thank you very much <clears throat> uh okay cool so yeah you're on time you were on time yeah, right, until you intervened. <laughs> um, yeah, so the next question kind of linked with, it kind of rolls quite naturally into this. So the, the term that we settled on after after quite a lot of forward and backwards, and we're still doing the forwards and backwards thing. That's kind of kind of why we're here. And, and actually part of our philosophy is that none of the stuff that we do is ever going to be properly set in stone. You know, it's always up for review. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's always up for... Uh, um, you know, involvement from you guys is one of our one of our key values as it is do it ourselves. Um, so yeah, we have come to the conclusion and by we I don't just mean me Dom Rach and the A team. I mean, we everybody on this call, everybody involved in it, you've all been part of that conversation came to a conclusion that single use pollution is a is a better term to describe not only the actual thing, but uh, that that term helps to influence the the behaviour that we're trying to stop or trying to impact uh, at the same time, just to just to build on what everyone else has been saying. So, is that the right term? Is is that the right term right now, based on the kind of things that you've heard? Uh, we'll go Nathan first because everyone else is is um, a bit biased, I guess. <laughs> I think the point I really want to make is, um, 
And I, I take the point that in the chat, and there's some interesting comments coming up now about litter versus pollution. I mean, so for me, you know, when you like you sort of Google um, um, litter campaigns and you see what else has been used. And then all I'm thinking is I'm looking at, well, who funds those campaigns and do they have the resources to take on the people that um, produce litter? So, so the journey I went on being sort of some, completely ignorant, really, in a way, other than, you know, somebody's sort of interested in this. I've not done any academic research in this yet. I've done a little bit. Um, so that whole revelation by Dom that um, litter bug was a term invented to kind of shift the problem away from the consumer to the uh, from the producer to the consumer. And um you know, we then discuss the ideas of shared responsibility between producer and consumer, rather you know rather than the blame game of the producer, it's their fault, and and they've successfully shifted it to the consumer. I'm now of the view, right? You've got to take them on their at their own game. Okay, so where the failure comes is not in the terminology, but what are the resources devoted to stopping people from throwing stuff away compared to the resources compared to getting people to buy it in the first place, and I think. We can change the terms, but I think that's tinkering around the edges. Like, what's the funding that Trash Free Trails receives? What's the funding that Zero Waste Scotland receives? What's the funding Keep Britain Tidy receives compared to the funding that, you know, Lucasaid spends on getting us to buy the thing in the first place? So, to me, that's where the issue lies. Is and um, so so my my if if it's a radical solution would be well, what we need to do is come up with an environmental brand terminology can be argued about that one i take the points in the chat where you 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 intervene at point of sale to say well do you really need that drink or could you fill it up in your own bottle you know to think of alternative solutions at that point to intervene earlier in 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 in, in, in the consumption chain and to just put money into it that could take them on because i think you can argue all you want but we're, we're always going to be on the losing end of this until we're funding anti-litter campaigns to the level that they're funding by Lucasay campaigns or, or or Prime, to use the latest one, right? Um, unless we get those guys behind Prime. Um, yeah, the ones who did Prime behind this, sorry. So that that would be, I don't know, I'm doing a politician answer. I'm giving you what I wanted to say regardless of what you asked me. <laughs> but that, that to me is where I've come on this journey is, you know, you go from this like, you know, my instinct is, well, they should stop producing the stuff. Um, and, and now I'm thinking, no, actually, we've got to take them on at what they do. Um, um, you know, they'll, they'll hire branders, marketers and spend millions on this stuff. And, and that's that's to me to intervene earlier um, so, so that people think twice at the point of. So once they've already bought the product, I think the problem, you're already on the back foot dealing with the problem. Right. Do we call it litter? Do we put it? How do we get them to dispose of that responsibly? Well, ideally, they shouldn't even buy it or at least in that form. Right. Can we have refillable bottles? Can we can we think of it that way? Um, uh, as well as, you know, one of the ideas we've discussed here is can we brand on the bottles to sort of make people look at that bottle and think twice in a simple visual image? Um, I'll just give you one quick example and then I'll shut up. Sorry. Is one of, so what led me to this research is we were looking to try and prevent people from using um, uh, um, single use masks during COVID. And one of the way suggestions we're going to make is the infographic that um, being recorded. that the government widely used, at least in the UK, was of a single-use mask, right? So it wasn't even the worst now word now. It was just they didn't even if they produce an infographic that showed a reusable mask, and that might contribute to solving the issue of using. Um, and of course, this is a litter issue that I don't think we're actually we're addressing at all. Not us here. I think this is an overlooked uh, after effect of the pandemic because we've got all these masks and what do we do with them, the non-reusable ones. And, and the infographic itself contributed to the problem. It wasn't even words used by, by, by shorthand suggesting wear a, dis, uh, a disposable mask. Um, and it hadn't been thought through. Someone just thought, well, that looks good. You know, the sort of thing you get on a toilet door. Now we're going to think twice about what we put on a toilet door um, in terms of that little sign of who is this toilet for. Right, it's that that kind of thing, and I think that's the sort of thing where we need to think more. Well, sorry if I've gone on too long. It's all right. Does anybody anybody want to? I bet everybody's got loads to say to that. So, mm. uh, shall I pick someone? I have question. I have a question. What Nathan said, and um, that's all really interesting. I feel like 
I, I, in my brain instantly went to like, who would, who would fund that? He, how could we match the funding of the big Coca Cola and like all the funding they have? And also, um, kind of, they benefit from the consumerism element to buying single use pollution things. So, it, they're not, they're not going to change at any time soon, I don't think. And so it feels like, yeah. I feel a bit more cynical with that element, I guess. Um, yeah, that's the practical side of it in my brain. I don't know. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's, 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 I don't know, it's just a blue sky thinking. You know, green yeah. It, I mean, my, my vision would be I walk into my local shop, um, especially in, you know, I live in Northwest Wales and um, as you've got that wall of, uh, you know, energy drinks, you know, somewhere there, think twice you know uh, uh something on the bottle you know um um to make you think you know obviously until you make a rule that says that coca has to give some percent of everything that they spend it still wouldn't be the same but it would be better um but suddenly where you can think you know could we encourage them to have taps of coca of, of, of lucas aid as opposed to mm -hmm. bottles of lucas aid you know that would you know that would go some way to solving the you know the issue of, of litter right because hopefully people might go in and get a discount if they could just fill their own, um, you know, like like they they encourage uh, the union they encourage us to take our own bottles and fill it with water, yeah. um, you know, rather than and and so so a bottle of Lucas Aid might be one pound. I have no idea how much it costs. Say one pound sixty, but you fill it yourself and you can get twice mm -hmm. as much. It's a pound, you know, to sort of encourage that kind of thing um, earlier on. But I, t I entirely take your point. You, you, you know, um, I would like to get some money to try and think this through in more detail oh is it this is one of those ones where there's a million ones for me it's like so there's two things me and nathan have had these conversations loads and, and they've always sparked and been really nice is that we talked about like say like rachel just asked in the in the <clears throat> in the questions there about um if we were to create a brand for the environment and i think that's that's something that excited me and it's easier said than done but is you know, again, my 11 year old niece, uh, I'm not sure if my sister's watching. Um, uh, if you are, sorry about your bad leg. She pulled a leg during netball last night. Um, uh, and and she, so she's, Coca-Cola is a really, really strong brand for her. And, and it, it literally influences, you know, behavior. And I, she was put, she put it in her rucksack in a certain way that I could tell was actually a fashion statement. Um, uh, so it, this th these things, and this, you know, again, this nudge theory stuff we're looking into, brands literally change the way things taste they either they you know improve or decrease the way things taste random tastes tests in the 80s found that pepsico pepsi was was tastier people liked the taste of pepsi more but it wasn't reflected in the in the um market share coca-cola still so the only explanation really was that that the, the brand made people taste it because when they tasted coke and they knew it was coke they preferred it apparently um I veered off there. So like, again, there is that question for me is like, what if we could create a brand for the environment that was that was equally as powerful, that 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 when they were making a decision, you know, so again, a lot of littering stuff is convenience based. So people, you know, there's the social scale, the social proof. So a is the litter around? Yes. OK, so it's not so it's not socially catastrophic to drop litter here. I won't be discarded by society. Um, and then B, uh, can I be bothered to take it back to the bin? No. So that, that that calculation means to drop it. But if you can make the brand environment strong enough to influence that behavior, then then you're perhaps perhaps getting somewhere. Um, and then you know, we thought about it a little bit. I'm very lucky, obviously, living in Snedonia National Park, Snowdonia, not Snedonia. Um, and, you know, is there a more powerful symbol of the outdoors or nature or whatever in the England and Wales in particular than Sn Snowdon, the mountain. So again, we've been toying with the fact of like a pilot scheme where we use Snowdon as that brand environment and see if we can use that to influence behavior. But Nathan and I, I still am very much for shared responsibility. Um, very much so because um, it is literally blame is batted back and forth and it will be forever. Um, and there's all kinds of things that exist within the middle ground. The real world exists within the middle ground. So what people should be doing or shouldn't be doing is of complete 
unimportant to me is what people are and aren't doing that's important and that's the middle that's in the middle so you know that's why we work with red bull but we work with red bull on a transparent and very critical friend basis and i talk about it here in this in this um meeting openly because it makes me nervous to be working with them and i understand that people on this call will probably disagree with it but if we want them to if they want their consumers to stop dropping their cans we need to speak to their consumers and we will not speak to their consumers if we make an enemy of them so there's this delicate balancing act to go there and i think the middle ground is where you're going to find that is where we're going to try and find um navigate that path petered off to the end there rich is probably waiting to move on no, no, we, we, we're good. As a guy, I could, I could give you another four minutes, but I'm not going to. Uh, no, don't give me. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, cool. I mean, that. I mean, the, the the branding for the environment conversation is super interesting. I mean, there's a couple of conversation, a couple of chats and questions and conversations going on in the chat itself that that talk about that. I mean, Mark, you said something like it's tough to think of something that would have a, a powerful enough effect on consumers to actually work. And you use the cigarettes as an example. I know loads of people that didn't start smoking because it, it's funny, you know, the, the guy with the, the weird doing weird stuff on the back of a cigarette packet is not, it's not going to put me off smoking. Um, so what what does that look like? And it, is it a word? Is it a symbol? Is, or is it, is it actually something way, way bigger than messaging on a fridge or on a label or something like that? Is, it, is, there, is there much more to it? Than that is it is it a deeper level of understanding around what these places might be able to do for you as in a com in combination with shared responsibility in combination with branding for the environment so <clears throat> it's certainly my belief that there isn't like one fix to this it's not it's not a, a picture on a fag packet it's not a message above a fridge <clears throat> and it's certainly not changing one word there, there's there's all sorts of other things going on here um so to finish off, <laughs> why why is the right language important in the pursuit of behaviour and therefore widespread cultural change? So we're finishing it off on a on a super light and easy to answer note. Uh, Chloe, I don't think you you didn't you didn't have a great deal uh, on the last one. So did you did you want to start with that one? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so obviously, uh, I'm just going to touch back slightly on uh, what Nathan said earlier about. And I could not agree more. It'd be amazing if we could get the same funding to to share the right branding to get like um, our environmental thoughts forward. Um, but we don't currently have the same funding as Lucas Aid or Coca Cola, as Lauren said, which is why I think it's even more important that we do use the right language now because there's multiple reasons why people um, I'm going to use the word listen here <laughs> begrudgingly why people listen in the first place. Um, whether that's like disconnection from nature or, or whatever it is, there, there's there's many reasons why that happens. And there's also many different reasons, I think, that we're going to get people's attention to solve that issue. Obviously, if we could do a, a massive multimedia marketing campaign, that would be great. But one part of, of a, a marketing, com marketing campaign, I'm sure, would be what language do you use? Um, I'm not a, a marketing student, but I'd imagine they're not just going to go throwing words around willy nilly. So something as simple as what we refer to it as is going to be really important. I think single use pollution as a term, uh, I hadn't heard of it before Trashy Trails. It was one of the the first meeting I think as an A-teamer was discussing it. Um, and I was like single use pollution. I think originally with the abbreviation was just put in and I was like stand up paddle boarding or is that like sup? Like are we just being really surfy and duty now? Like. Um, but actually, single-use plastics, I think, is a term that's that's we hear a lot, and litter is a term we've heard a lot. But single-use pollution actually invoked something within me that made me actually think a little bit more about it. I picked up lots of litter, but did I actually think necessarily about what it was? Not at the time, and it was something that that spurred something in me. And I know now that having conversations with other people, it has done the same. So I think, yeah, using the right language is important. And whether that, I don't know how it comes into it culturally, but I think, yeah, single use pollution, is it a term that many people use in their day to day life? Probably not. So that's probably going to spark some sort of interest, regardless of who you are. And if that gets a message across, then I guess that's, it's doing its job then.
Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, Chloe, you, you 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 sort of nailed both both questions a little bit there. Um, you know, in in short, is single use pollution a better term? Yes. <laughs> um, but for 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 a whole variety of different reasons that you talk about. Um, so and and Chloe, you said that to 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 the second question, why is the right language important in the pursuit of behaviour and behaviour change, and therefore widespread cultural change? Yeah, it's 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 what you hang that marketing campaign off, right, Nathan? Like, there's yes, it is more than a word, and it is more than known culture, but you've got to hang that on something, and and I guess that's why we're here. So, I'll I'll put it back to you, Nathan. Is single use pollution a better term than litter for uh, solving the problem that you're trying to talk about? Whether whether it's investment, whether it's branding for the environment, whether it's the beautifully simple act of chucking a cigarette butt out the window is single use pollution is is single use pollution a better word and how important could that be to the change to the change in in culture that we're trying to go for um well i'm gonna bring um another boris johnson example and, and say no i don't think it would work and i'll tell you why um and i do want to respond to the smoking thing i think the interesting thing about smoking is like in in, in my lifetime and i suppose many other people's here we've gone from you know when i was um a teenager and, and and a student you know you'd walk through the crowds of people smoking <laughs> indoors and then eventually outdoors um so like not at all it's like it, it amazes me how quickly you know that i come across people i think well who smokes anymore they might vape but like who actually smokes a cigarette so there has been significant behavior change in a relatively short space of time um you know i don't know that that's down to the stuff on the packets um but, but, you know, I, I suppose if we review the literature on that behaviour change is really interesting because it has gone from, you know, when I was 16, oh, that was cool. You wanted to smoke some soft pack camels, right? And um, through to, I can't believe people actually smoke cigarettes, you know, in, 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 in the space of 35 years. Um, to come back to um, the point I was going to make, you know, it's like, I, I think the problem with the single um, use pollution Point is it's very wordy you have to think it through it doesn't trip off the tongue and fit nicely into an advertising campaign of just do it or whatever you know that's a night one but uh, you know what the um you know what what lucas aid or others are doing um it, it's that it's the problem with that the, the anti-brexit versus the brexit arguments take back control right whether you agree with it or not so we'll leave that aside is just such an easier slogan to understand and swallow and then oh well the, the eu is really good for xx so so that you know and I, I see the danger in that that we 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 might get something too wordy even if it's more accurate um that, that would then it, it's not easy to well, swallow i say you know easy to digest to understand um even if it's a better term more accurate and and, and um goes with what what people say i just want to respond back to what quickly dom said is i'm not arguing for a kind of um combative approach because obviously we have to work with producers in the end um and to me that would be the best way and could you know like the, the example that was put in the chat can you convince these organizations to, to to think of a different way of disseminating their product to consumers that this doesn't always have to be in things that can be littered you know, can we incentivize them that way? And you know, we have the argument about glass bottles, recycling, and you know, the pros and cons of that. Is there a way of like, well, have you thought about, you know, making it a bit cheaper, but letting people take a bit more um, so that we don't actually have a bottle problem, for example, um, if I know that's, that's one of them. So, and the other thing about the branding on, on the, is can we have a sh simple, short visual symbol? Um, you know, one of the things we discussed that Bangor is a choking squirrel. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, to go on a bottle, it's not going to compete with the branding on the whole thing. Yeah, you, you know, the, the visuals of a Lucas A bottle, Coke, any of them are going to dominate the eye. But could there be something for someone who might actually catch it and think twice? Like, we, it might not work, but we haven't tried it, is the point. Similarly, I'd say, well, we haven't tried single use pollution. Or have we you know mass mass so so let's throw lots of um solutions at it and see what sticks so i'm not against it but i can see the issues with with something that's wordy 
you know, multi-syllabic. Yeah, I think um, I think come back to a few things, like a few things, maybe back to some founding some founding principles and values of trash free trails. So um, the, the, this is a balancing act. At the moment we're talking, we've 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 naturally veered towards trying to solve the problem completely. Does that makes sense. Trying to tackle it completely as a, you know us on this call which is amazing and i'm i'm uh, i like the fact we've gone there but one thing we we talk about a lot of trash free trails is that we um we have no intention and we, we recognize our place within the conservation ecosystem we recognize that we are plankton if you want to if you want to use a kind of marine food web analogy we've got no intention or desire to be to be charismatic megafauna uh, in, you know the surface against sewage is the marine conservation societies or green pieces um and one reason one for one reason is because i want to be disruptive i want to be creative i want to be different and i want to try to spark new ways of doing things um so i saw jill earlier comment that um and, and I, I i must admit if i'd seen it just without your name next to it jill hulsby i would have probably guessed you saying it because you said about how um the word brand even makes you uncomfortable and i really like that i was like yes interesting because we've got two which is why i'm really excited by the branching study that we're doing with nathan and with bang university because they're not mutually exclusive our approach and being involved with the study that, the way that nathan wants to lead that study they're not mutually exclusive they can plug into each mm -hmm. other really well um so for me it's that it's that it's going back to why are we doing it like we're doing it we're doing it because we don't like the status quo. We we don't want to be stuck on a hamster wheel of litter picking every spring, like many organisations are. You know, oh, we, we litter picked. It was wonderful. We solved the problem. Um, and we're sponsored by all of these companies who who are essentially greenwashing, um, and greenwashing and paying us to pick up their, their products. So, yeah, for me, it's, again, coming back to that, pioneering spirit that i want us to again maybe not the word we should use anymore but yeah that, that i want us to try and remember as well as an organization yeah thanks <clears throat> thanks tom um just i'm uh, just going to pick up on a, a couple of things that have been just on that and also a couple of things that have been said in the in the chat sorry sorry jill i didn't see your hand up go for it that's, is it all right to speak now or do you want me to wait for later actually sorry uh, that's good that's good crack on um I've just had this thought kind of in my mind with the brand and I haven't got like nice language, but maybe with a group of people, we can make it neater. But is, is there something about kind of like linking the, this, not just saying single use pollution, but like, you know, pollution from profit or pollution created, you know, kind of linking it back to where it came from. And actually the reason we have single use is basically because people can make money. And more, is there some more money. Yeah, more money quicker, yeah. Yeah, is, is there some way that we can get like a nice, neat phrase that links the fact it's polluting to the fact that this is basically created to make money and just you know, like industrial profiteering pollution or something, I don't know, but oh, we thought. <laughs> I, yeah, and I think I think that this is this is much again, I could I don't personally want us to want expect or want or need us to try and solve this now i think again the conversation for me is the is the most important part at this moment in time because we're beginning uh, you know to see if we can try and do things differently and you're not going to you're not going to fix that quickly so you know i wouldn't i wouldn't want us to feel frustration on this call if we're not quite getting it nailed down you know uh, if we're not quite agreeing how wonderful is it to not agree you know as well and but then to not have a hissy fit about it and you know, go all Piers Morgan on on ourselves. You know, it's like, it's um, you know, that's again, the the like the kind of sub mission of Trash Free Trails, and me and Rich and Rachel, you know, is to do things differently and to have challenging conversations. You know, um, so yeah, um, thanks, Jill. <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, thanks again. Um, so sorry, I was just going to pick up a couple of things um, that Dom said about how how we do things like a little bit differently and something that interestingly hasn't come up <clears throat> in this in this conversation so much and it's what M Pope said in the chat around disconnection so M you talked about 
people not littering in their own homes. And I have a, I have a really good example of that. When I was, uh, I went to, we have a trash mob academy. It's a, it's our education project. It looks to develop self esteem, confidence, uh, and overall well being in young people. Um, we did a little talk about that in October that you may have been at, you may have missed. Uh, there will be more. Um, but yeah, I went, I went to a graduation of one of those in Bristol with our friends at Pedal Progression. Um, there's three, three sort of 12 to 14 year old girls, and they were in like, you know, the port cabin at the back of the classroom, at the back of the school, the, the naughty kids. Um, two of them were loving it, and the other one was just not, she was just not doing it, you know, not riding the bike, giving us the finger, I'm going for a fag, you know, all of that. Um, but she was quite fun, you know, quite jokey and stuff. You never, you never want to like, you're not going to just tar those people off to the side. And I had a little chat with her and she, she was like, oh, I don't care about any of this. I'm still going to litter. I was like, okay, cool. Are you going to litter there? She's like, yep. You're gonna, and then I sort of gave her a load of different examples and I got to, she's like, oh, well, I live in flats. So I'll just, I'll just chuck my rubbish out the window. I was like, okay, cool. So you're going to do it in the hallway. Yeah. It's not my hallway. I don't care. Yeah. You're going to do it in the living room. It's not my, whole, you know, it's not, I don't care. It's like, okay. So right. What about your bedroom? And she's like, no, not never in my bedroom. I was like, right, I got you. <laughs> um, so I said to said to her, like, what if I told you, like, you've had a good day with me and Ollie and the guys at Pedal Question, you've had a bit of fun. She was like, yeah, cool. So what if I told you that these trails that you said that you'd litter on mean as much to me as and Ollie as 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 your bedroom does to you? And she was like, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm still gonna do it, but it made her think. And and M and M in the chat there said. People aren't littering in their own homes where they feel a sense of belonging and appreciate appreciation of their surroundings. So how do you encourage that feeling of respect and belonging in their own, in their local urban and natural environment so that it feels unacceptable in those places too? So the cultural change that we're looking for isn't just from that, like, don't buy it, don't dispose of it incorrectly angle. The whole other end of the spectrum actually is, is where my heart lies in, in this is how important can this place be for you and how important is it for the other people that you share it with and 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 why is that important so i think someone earlier on in the chat referenced young people and education and stuff and um i just wanted to say that we are we are on on the other end of this um as well so we're actually bang on time for uh, about 15 minutes of of q a now so over to you guys over to the floor there's been a lot of stuff in going on in the chat so that's super super cool um so i will just have a rach have you got anything like any questions from earlier on i'll just have a quick scroll to see if anybody's yeah there was a question earlier i want to see if i can find it can i make a quick comment just um whilst it. yeah, yeah it's just about the belonging thing sorry sorry if i'm jumping in it'll be quick it's really interesting because you know if you live in an urban area uh, like I live in Bangor, uh, downtown metropolitan Bangor. Um, you know, a lot of, I think, the litter in, in areas sort of where I walk, I think are done by teenagers, you know, on the way out of school and whatnot. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these discussions might, you know, well, actually, I know it, a lot of it is them about litter, single-use plastic isn't going to work there. And also that sense of belonging, it's interesting, you know, some of us are aware we live in a beautiful area. For them, it's just there every day and they're normal and they're not. I don't think there's a sense of belonging, I mean, belonging in that way, or guardianship, I suppose, would be the word I'd be looking for, um, when they're just chucking their stuff. Um, so it'd be interesting how one can make an intervention with with, with teenagers, because um, if you can intervene then, at least then you've created some, uh, you know, when they grow into adults. Um, but I, yeah, a sense of guardianship for what they just see is, oh, this is the area I live in, and it's boring, or whatever that, you know, a teenager might say. I need the, well, you the, the Trash Mob Academy art example to kind of cover that in, in the film that we've all got. Check out the YouTube channel, subscribe, all that, like, share, subscribe. Um, Joe, Joe says that their playgrounds, their streets, they're not places that they get a buzz off because they see it every day. They see it all the time. They haven't got any ownership over it. But the first thing is that when we took those kids or when Joe took those kids to trails, encourage them to have a good time on the trail and enjoy it and have a bit of protection of the trail there's no way that they're going to drop rubbish on the trail and they're also not going to um you'll note my diversion from the word there uh they're also gonna have an have like a uh a protection over that place and a kind of behavior that they're never going to do that but they're also going to stop everybody else like they're going to protect it from other people that 
mentality translated to the street. So whilst we, um, you know, the keys in the name for us, Trash Free Trails is, is, is the focus of it and where it all starts. And we, that's kind of, I guess what Dom said, like, we're not, we're not going to solve this now. We're not, we're probably not going to solve this as we are. What we're, we're definitely not going to solve is your, your teenagers chucking their takeaways out on the street. If we can get those teenagers out in the in in the hills and in into onto a trail and see if they they're up for protecting that, who knows? They might be up for protecting their street. Because I'll be honest with you, I have no idea about how to tell a teenager how to not chuck their prime drink vape on the street if it's a matter of just saying to them, "Don't chuck your vape on the street" because they're not going to listen to me. Um, so yeah, that's that's. I wasn't on the panel, uh, but <laughs> I have got quite a strong thought on that. I know, Dom, Dom you've been... you've been. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's been... Because uh, I wanted to do something as well, just to... Uh, I'm always feeling that urge of trying to, like, um, you know, package things up so we feel like... I don't know. I can't quite explain it. So essentially, I don't... I'm, I'm wary of the sense of frustration that you open you open a can and you don't finish it, you know? And 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 I saw... So I, I was kind of thinking, we're moving into this questions now is that maybe maybe be a bit i'm going to be a bit selfish and bring the conversation in to trash free trails so the, we we've we're holding you know what we can control off the back of this meeting is how we as an organization behave with the information that we've gathered during the conversation and and and, and the things that you you know wonderful people who've donated your time to come and join us um have, have given new ideas to us so you know, recently you might have noticed um, that we have um, just slightly changed, well, actually not significantly changed our mission statement, um, which really, I suppose, is our kind of guiding light. You know, it's our North Star, to use that term. Um, and it's, it was written by Rach, actually. Um, so it was amazing. I read it in one of her speeches that she did um, during the Right to Rome campaign. Um, so our mission is to reconnect um, people with nature through the simple yet meaningful act of removing single-use pollution from our wild places. So I'm being selfish and thinking, right, how does this conversation and how do the questions we're asking in this conversation, um, what do they mean for our mission? Uh, because if we don't, if we, if we lose focus and distill, um, you know, uh, our, our approach, we're going to try to do too much and get nothing done. And again, I think that's been a big issue that's been exploited probably as well um, of environmental campaigns, anti-litter campaigns. Uh, so that's that's that mission. And so then analyzing that, which term um, helps us achieve that mission better, I suppose, is the, is the way I'm asking, is the way I'm thinking about this outcome of this, of this conversation in my head. And then also what, what, uh, it doesn't have to be a catch-all too. It doesn't have to be like litter, a verb and a noun. It could just be the term that we use that it is. And then we move on from that. And then the other one is obviously what responsibility and what techniques, what, and let's encapsulate all in the, what is our language of litter that we use as an organization that we believe might help us create the changes we're trying to create. So it's almost like I'm trying to bring it back in at the end, Rich, forgive me if I'm doing a hosting thing, but I feel like a, maybe 15, 20 different conversations sparked off. And that might have been where a frustration came because I'm like, oh, it doesn't really fit when we talk about it, what Nathan went, spoke about. It doesn't really work there. But bringing it back to the, the OG genesis of the conversation, that's, yeah, that's what I'd like to do at the end, if we can. You, you, you took the words out of my mouth, but the, the, the floor is for everybody else just now. So go for it, floor. Um, what you got for us? I, I I can do dead air if you, if you want me to. <laughs> I'd much rather. Perhaps, um, there, was a, there was a question posed a little bit earlier in the chat, uh, which was around how could we create something big enough to hold these kind of huge brands, these huge corporations accountable? And I'm kind of going to reframe that into a question around to the panel around what do you think uh, we need, whether that's trash free trails or just in, as individuals on this panel, what do you think we need to do to help our communities better understand 
single use pollution to better understand litter? What do we need to do to change people's minds and change people's perspectives? Maybe I'll throw that to Lauren first. Um, I think uh, what immediately came to my mind was the disconnection element and my favourite quote by Cal Major is the, the spin-off from like people protect what they love, but they only love what they know. So I think the, the, the main thing to focus on would be finding young people the things that they love and hopefully that having an impact on not dropping litter trash. Uh, yeah, that's, that's me done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Parker, uh, sorry, Chloe, would you like to uh, comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think what Lauren said is is definitely spot on. Like, um, as Cal Major wisely once said, people do protect what they love. And if I do, I massively believe that disconnection to nature is one of the reasons why people do do bad things to the environment. And if we can address that as a whole, obviously that would be great. Um, is is uh, everything sort of spirals over into that sort of sense of there's a lot of big tasks at hand of you know people oh i think we lost chloe oh. <laughs> <laughs> no worries <Not> at all. <laughs> any we've got one from claire in the in the chat there thanks claire does being visible in the community clearing litter positively influence people to not to not drop litter or does it encourage people to take responsibility as someone else would do it so so sorry I, I think i'm understanding it right that you're asking that does seeing people litter picking uh contribute to the problem right yeah yeah cool. that's what i was saying yeah it's uh, yeah i was just thinking uh yeah about that does it positively like influence people or does it make them think oh actually someone else will do it so i don't have to <laughs> I am um, all right to yeah. I respond rather than answer. Um, is I think I think yes. I think there's there's some some studies that suggest that that's that, that backs that up that thought. Um, and again, it's all right. Well, what's what's I'm always thinking. What's our response to that as an organisation? What's our what's our um, ethos? And there's some other examples. You know, for example, um, the 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 big spring cleanup i mean i'm sure loads of us on this call are now you know have, have probably done loads of them but you know this year will be this year will be my 13th year in a row i've been involved in some form of big spring cleanup i definitely won't find less litter than i've ever than i found i'd arguably find more um so again we're thinking about that what's going on there like you know the, there's there's an implication it makes it the, all of those cleanups make the news there's, is there is there an implication there that um, that that's all we have to do to um, to keep things clean? We just got to do a big cleanup every year, and then we can crack on as, as as before. And then also the other go back to that kind of probably conspiracy theory thing that I've got is look at who sponsors these big cleanups, and why do they get such big coverage? Is it because of that implication that it's okay we do it once a year and then we can carry on as normal? So. Uh, I'm with you on that. I'm one thing again. We we did in our philosophy player this year was right at the very start is that for us as trail users, we believe that uh, we believe that the 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 simple act of removing single use pollution from the place we love is a is a is a twenty four seven three six five commitment. It's just simply part of who we are as trail users. So you don't have to talk about it all the time, and it also frees you up to talk about deeper uh, things. You know, it, talk, it frees us up to talk about all right. Well, if we don't if we don't want to be picking it up forever, we need to we need to really get a handle a scientific handle on what's going on. What are the causes, prevalence, impacts, um, which brings us back to our state of our trials report uh, or the work we, we would like to do with Nathan. So, I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> social permission. It kind of it kind of has to be this like, um, you know, multifaceted approach campaign whatever you want to call it uh because there's so many different factors at play again one of our values is that the problem we're trying to tackle is a hugely symptom of a hugely interconnected web of other problems 
and I guess that kind of lends itself to the shared responsibility um, philosophy, right? And and even if even if you disagree with the shared responsibility philosophy, there's more than one party at play. Um, so, Jill, your question here, is there an argument about not allowing big corporations to make and sell things that ultimately damage and pollute the environment? Uh, and that, you know, it links, you know, logically links to the concept of environmental exploitation. So not just connecting people with wild places, but also corporates with the impact of their practices. I mean, the 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 ironist, ironyist in in me, the big corporations know what they're doing. You know, it's 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 not, it's it's not a matter of oh okay, this is bad is it oh okay i'm really sorry about that um it 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 would be it would be very difficult to it would be very difficult to do that and and i think that there's lots of people and organizations just stop oil you know um it, it that's not i don't feel that that's something i can do something about um and I don't know whether that's something that I don't know whether that's a shared belief, but what I can do something about is is reconnecting the the girl Rachel, her name is Rachel as it goes, uh, in in Bristol with her place and and with the other people that she shares that space with. So I guess it's about for me at least, it's about finding out what you think you can do, um, and then I, as a collective, we need to come together to, for because there's more you can do is more than more than a sum of your parts. Um, Rachel, you got your hand up. Technical support. <laughs> Technical support coming <laughs> in with a question. I hope that's okay. Um, I wonder if, uh, thank you for that, Rich, because I think that's a real empowerment of the fact that uh, every individual is capable of doing something, even that's if that's changing one person's life, that's still change and that's still amazing. Um, so I wonder if on that note, maybe everyone on the panel could share because I feel like also we've talked around like lots of really complicated, interconnected and really big things. And I feel like it's important that we all leave with a sense of hope. So I wonder if everyone on the panel wouldn't mind sharing perhaps one or two words on uh, when it comes to these kind of problems, when it comes to the, the litter problem, as it often gets called, uh, what brings you hope, I guess is my question. <laughs> so I'm not going first. I'm not doing it. Phoebe says community. Oh, thank you. Okay, you can so keep cooking your tea, Phoebe. It's all good. We got you. Yeah, I'd love it if other people would drop them in the chat as well. That would be amazing. And the fact that Phoebe said that is about community is to say hello, Phoebe, because Phoebe was, me and Phoebe were part of the same community a few years ago when we were at Surface Against Sewage. And it's been a while since I've spoken to her. So hello, Phoebe. <laughs> Um, or fee. Um, okay, I will go because um, um, maybe maybe spark some people on. Um, talk to loads, of course, always. Uh, so, yeah, the risk. I, I've always got Nathan as well because I can imagine Nathan, you know, um, you know, rolling eyes at me or something. But but the the first thing is that yeah, it's not again go back to that ecosystem, go back to that plankton thing. Is to not to not give the implication or feeling or the, to you all or to anyone who's listening to us that we are solving all of the world's issues. Like um, we're really aware of some of the, you know, arguably bigger issues, you know, climate crisis perhaps being the largest, but obviously there's, 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 there's other massive ones as well. Um, but we, we believe that by staying true to what we feel really passionate about and what we feel we have a skill set to create some positive change on can set a really nice example um and simple things like people donating their time tonight to come and spend time with us and share their thoughts gives me hope but what also what gives me hope is is uh, is going back to our desire to create critical consumers critical thinkers because that's I would say one of the parallel issues with this connection is that we're we're not stopping and thinking and using skills to analyze what we're being told enough, and then we're not having difficult conversations enough. So, um, I I would like to think that the the way that would give me hope would be a bit more realism and honesty. So 
you know, acknowledgement of the issue, acknowledgement that it's not, it's it, what's what's happened, but then acknowledging it and, and going, right, well, what are we going to do about it? And then from that point on, transparency amongst the parties of, um, you know, if, what you're trying to do together. If it's not working, don't worry, be transparent about it, own it. And then the other one is to say own it, accountability, like actually hold each other to account, you know, uh, firmly yet positively. That's the kind of stuff that gives me hope. And that's what we what we're trying to role model at Trash Free Trails. Um, and I and 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 yeah, so th th that, th those are the things really is the fact that we're doing I've been seeing that happen in our call. Um, and uh, so that's making me hopeful for both Trash Free Trails and, you know, the wider environmental and social justice movement. Thanks, Tom. I'll just try I'll just uh, I think on that note, we can probably probably finish because everybody should be having their should have had their dinner a while ago so it'll be a late dinner now just to pick up on a couple of hopeful themes from the comments communication and community and uh small changes that ryan's just dropped in there keep coming up um in in all your guys suggestions so hopefully we're we're hitting ticking some of those boxes hopefully we're not ticking some of those boxes because we can't do everything like dom said so yeah Thanks so much uh, for everybody for joining us. I think we ended up with just over 50, which is uh, it's a first time for us. And uh, thanks for everybody for hanging on. And uh, yeah, look out for the next one. Rachel's going to send over some links um, for you guys to check out around. Well, what are they around, Rachel? What you got? What you got for us? Thank you so much, Rich. So I'm just about to drop in some links to <clears throat> where you can find Trash Free Trails on your various digital endeavours. I'm also going to drop in a couple of links into some of the resources, some of the articles and stuff, uh, and some of the topics that were mentioned in case you'd like to do, go old school, do a little bit of further reading. Um, thank you so much for joining us, guys. Cheers, guys. Thank you, everyone. Nate, yeah, thanks, everyone. Forgot then, loads of people were in the meeting. <laughs> They're still here. Hey, uh, thanks very much for that. Thanks for joining us. Hey, I'm a... right. no, I was late. Well, I was going to say, what gives me hope, and, and this is something they could do, is that local authorities who just ban um, with takeaways, like don't have polystyrene. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the, that, well, the, the great thing is that there, the, there is, as well as the, the this, um, the, the deliberate push towards individualizing responsibility, that big business done. It, government is finally stepping in on a few things. So we've got that ban that's coming into force and on um, uh, single use plastics cutlery. So you literally that that chip shop now doesn't have the opportunity to go to do a cost benefit analysis and go, oh, it's easier to get plastic. They just can't do it because it'll be illegal. You know, the product won't exist. So I think that's there is a definite policy interventions that need to be made. Deposit return system in 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 Europe, there is no, not single. You won't find a plastic bottle anywhere on the streets in Germany, because if it gets dropped, it gets picked up by someone who wants to get the twenty cents back. Um, so yeah, those two things together, I think, will be helpful. But it will take a while. <laughs> we still got some listeners. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to hang around, people who are people who are still listening. <laughs>